we'll go ahead and have Joe um, introduce SRPC and the Resiliency Subcommittee, and I'll just monitor the uh, waiting room as folks join. And go ahead, Joe. Okay, thanks, Adam. My name is Joe Boudreau. I'm the chair of the uh, Resiliency Subcommittee of SRPC. Uh, and I'd like to uh, thank everyone for joining us today and taking the time on a particularly stormy time to, uh, to join us. The Resiliency Subcommittee of SRPC was formed two years ago to bring focus on resiliency to Stratford Region. Our intent is to host quarterly roundtables like the one today. We hope these roundtables engage folks and begin dialogue on resiliency issues. During the past year, we've had roundtables on topics including water, food, and energy. In each of our roundtables, we have been fortunate to have local and regional panelists bring context, information, and insights into specific areas. I want to thank our panelists for joining us today on a topic that is important to all of us, energy. I look forward to their discussion and encourage attendees to provide their input and questions to the discussion. Autumn. Thank you, Joe. And sorry if you all can hear the fire truck in the background here. Um, so we have Brad and Dave from Unitil here, and they are um, part of the New Hampshire Saves program, as well as Frank, who is from Eversource. Um, and they're going to go ahead and give a little bio and introduce themselves. Um, and if you would like, while they're doing that, you can type your name and your reason for attending into the chat. Um, you can go ahead, Brad, if you'd like to start. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Brad Hunter. I'm with uh, Unitil. I manage our commercial rebate program here at Unitil. Uh, and in that role, I work in both New Hampshire and Massachusetts, where we have customer bases there. Um, I've been in the energy efficiency industry for a lot longer than I'd like to admit, uh, probably somewhere around 35 years now. And I've um, done a, a great deal of project management, sales, a little bit of engineering, uh, all in the energy efficiency world. Um, have a mechanical engineering degree, uh, but I often tell people I'm not a real engineer. I just play one on TV, um, meaning I've never really done any real heavy engineering, but I have the mathematical degree to, to, to show that I could do it if asked. Uh, but most of the work I've done has, uh, has been on the project management side and the sales side of things. Um, I uh, reside with my family out of York, Maine, and I work out of the Portsmouth, New Hampshire office uh, where I'm located now. And I'll turn it over back to you, Autumn, or over to Dave, if that's okay. Sure, yeah, Dave, you can go ahead. Sure, sure, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Bollier. Um, I am the municipal and community uh, manager here with Unitil. Um, I've been in the business here for, oh geez, 26, 27 years. Um, primarily working out of our Portsmouth office, but I've uh, uh, worked up in our Portland area and down in our Brockton region as well when uh, uh, the companies were a little different, either Bay State Gas or Northern Utilities. Uh, the names change every so many years. Um, so my role here is more on the customer connection side and uh, how do I, and how do we kind of bridge that customer to the company and, and how does our distribution system benefit the customer um, capacity, um, expansions to that distribution system. And, and then I'll work with folks like Brad to kind of bring in the whole picture of how do we, what's the best thing we can do with the customer to, to meet their goals. Um, and, uh, and especially in the energy efficiency as we, they connect on new equipment. Um, so yeah, I reside here uh, in the Dover, New Hampshire area, a UNH grad myself. So, and I also work with UNH on the campus needs. Um, so uh, I really never left UNH from the time I graduated there. I've been on campus ever since. Uh, so not a bad place to be. 
Thank you, Dave and Frank, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm Frank Melanson. I am the supervisor of the residential programs uh, for Eversource, and I do represent the New Hampshire Saves programs uh, for residential. I've been at Eversource for about 20 years um, running energy efficiency programs, and I live uh, on the seacoast with my family and two dogs and two cats, so we have a pretty busy household. All right, thanks all. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone of these functions here on Zoom before we get started. You can mute yourself by clicking this, bot this button, which you should see in the bottom left corner. Um, and you can also unmute yourself that way. And if you're having issues with your audio, you can click this little up arrow to adjust your settings and same with the video, um, stop and start. And then this is the chat bubble where you can type things in so that everyone can see or you can choose to privately message someone. And then here you can use this button to raise your hand or to use any of the reaction buttons. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll turn it over to Jackson. Okay, everyone. Well, thank you all for, for joining this resiliency uh, subcommittee roundtable session. Uh, we hope you, you find this information valuable from our participants today. We're going to kick things off uh, with Brad and Dave, and then we'll go over to, to Frank for his portion of the presentation. Um, feel free to put your questions in the chat. We will be monitoring those. You're also welcome to raise your hand. Uh, this is meant to be discussion based. So after you know we work through the presentations, it, it's good to pause and have some discussion about the content and really how this fits into a broader context of resiliency and how folks in the community in our region can really take advantage of New Hampshire saves. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brad if you want to go ahead and try to share your screen, please. All right, let me give that a try. Um, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Autumn, so I'm trying, I'm clicking share screen <clears throat> and the tabs across the top have Chrome tab window or entire screen. Oop, hold on, I think we've got it. How's that? Anything? Good, yeah, so I'm seeing your entire screen. Yep, there we go. Um... Looks great. All right. And I apologize. Now I'm not able to look right now. I'm seeing my, I'm seeing the whole presentation on my screen now. So I don't see, I can't see everyone else here, which um, is fine, like, I suppose. But. <laughs> yeah, it might be helpful if instead of sharing your entire screen, you just share the PowerPoint. Share the window. Yeah. Well, so, if I, so hold on. Oh, uh, so new share, just a window then. Yeah. And then just click present there and you should be able to see it. Nope, same thing. Hmm. Well, I'm going to, I'll fire away with this. I just won't be able to see everyone's lovely faces there. Um, yeah, are you, so I, are you just able, uh, sorry, Brad, are you able yeah. to click present so that we can see the, um, the slide full screen? Uh, click present from, from yeah, Correct. in the PowerPoint um, window itself, not a Zoom function. In the PowerPoint. Uh, yes, the one you were just on. Sorry. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just clicking show the PowerPoint from the beginning when you so present online. No, um, just from oh. beginning is fine. Okay. Yep. Well, okay, so I'm showing it from the beginning. Are, are you seeing my opening slide there or not? 
No, huh? I'm click wondering from current. If, click sorry, from current no. slide. I'm wondering if you have, do you have two screens or is it a single laptop? It's a single laptop, although I removed it from a second so screen. In mm. the bottom right there, where you see the um, the minus and the plus sign to mm -hmm. the left of the minus, that little mm -hmm. that's the present that should put it full screen. If you click that. Yep, I got that. Mm -hmm. Still not seeing it, huh? Brad, I think it's the share screen. I think you have to share the different screen with the full one. It's the share screen. So like in Zoom, change your share again and pick the full window. Okay. So if I stop sharing and share screen, I've got the tabs are Chrome tab window and entire screen. So I'll click entire screen. Sure, go with that one. And then share. So can you see my screen now? Yep, I can see All myself right. on your screen. All right, so if I click from beginning here, yes, that'll show the slides. And there we go. Can, now you've got it, which I think we might have been there, but I, I yeah. can't see the rest of everyone yeah. else, So, which is fine by me. So, all right, apologize for all that. Thanks uh, for bearing with us, folks. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the New Hampshire Saves commercial and industrial programs. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that, uh, f first of all, uh, a lot of people think that New, New Hampshire Saves is a company or an organization or its own entity. Um, and uh, really, New Hampshire Saves is, is, a, is a brand. Uh, so the, um, uh, the investor-owned utilities in, in New Hampshire uh, all, all work and operate under the New Hampshire Saves program. Uh, but there are, you know, there are, there isn't an actual New Hampshire Saves organization. It's uh, it's really represented by uh, the four utilities that you see at the bottom of my screen here. Um, we all uh, uh, offer one program together. So we offer the New Hampshire Saves program of incentives, um, and for the most part, we all operate very similar incentive programs. We use the same applications. Um, but but there sometimes are some some uh, uh, what I hope are uh, uh, fairly insignificant and subtle differences between our offerings. Uh, but as I'm talking today, uh, in in um, most of the folks in the audience right now, I, I believe our customers um, on the electric side, they're Eversource customers in Stratford County, and on the uh, gas side, uh, Unitil serves a couple of towns. Um, so I'm going to be talking all about the New Hampshire Saves programs. I'm going to try to keep it at a, at a fairly high level, uh, maybe get down to a mid-level. Uh, but please bear in mind, I'm going to, I'll try to point out if there may be some subtle differences in areas, but generally what I'm going to be describing is the New Hampshire Saves offerings that Eversource and, and Unitil have on the commercial side. So with that rather long-winded uh, 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 explanation, I wanted to jump in for starters, uh, and, and I wanted to just open up with a case study of some of the work I do, and hope, hopefully uh, something you find interesting and engaging right off the bat. And with that in mind, um, I, this was a customer that I worked with uh, a couple of years back. Uh, uh, they grow uh, annual flowering annuals, and they sell those wholesale uh, uh, as, as baskets, and they sell flats of annuals as well, largely to, um, uh, to, to big box stores in the area. And uh, these folks did a lighting project, and I want to describe that lighting project a, a little bit if I can. Um, although actually, before I get into that, um, I wanted to open up with a case study that people would be engaged with and interested in. So I'm, I don't know, I'm an energy geek. I might find what we're looking at here kind of interesting, but uh, let, me, uh, let me pull this one out. I'm not gonna talk about this one. Let's jump to this one. Now this one, to me, might be a little more interesting for some people. Now we've got a customer of mine that I'm working with, totally separate project. And, uh, and these folks, um, uh, they grow a different kind of flower. This is a, a cannabis grow facility. Um, and full disclosure, I'll say these folks are, um, uh, th this customer is actually down in Massachusetts. 
in our Massachusetts territory. I, I work with a, a number of our grow facilities down there. Um, uh, so even though I, it is Massachusetts, I, I, I thought I'd, I thought this would be an interesting case study to show folks. Uh, principles are all the same. The incentive amounts are the same that we offer in Massachusetts as we would in New Hampshire. Uh, the only thing is uh, that cannabis is legal to grow in, in, in Massachusetts. So this is a legitimate business. Um, so uh, with that in mind, now let's look at this case study for a different kind of flower grower. Um, uh, th so the way our, our incentive programs work with this type of customer, uh, the, these folks uh, were building a new facility in Massachusetts, um, and we have a, a new construction offering. And again, this is the this is the way this project would have played out in New Hampshire as well if this facility was in New Hampshire. Uh, so this grow facility. Uh, they have options as they're building their grow facility. They can put in uh, 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 what typical growers grow with when they grow cannabis uh, is typically a thousand watt high pressure sodium fixture. Um, and uh, they have an option though that with a more efficient lighting fixture, which is an LED fixture. Uh, a challenge with the LED fixture though is there's uh, quite a bit more cost with those fixtures. So when we work with a customer that's doing this new construction type of project, <clears throat> what we look at programmatically is we look at what's the difference in cost between the baseline, which is the inefficient type of system, and the uh, efficient option they can put in, which is the LED uh, option here. So for this particular grower, uh, they were looking at a total of 92 fixtures. And the LED fixtures, the LED version was going to cost them just about $90,000 more for those LED fixtures. Uh, and if we look at the financials below the annual energy savings, you can see it's probably a four or five year payback uh, to put in these LED fixtures without any incentive. Uh, oftentimes we find the, the commercial customers we work with, a lot of times a two or three year payback is really a key threshold to hit for a lot of decision making. Um, and this particular uh, uh, project, uh, through our programs, we were off, able to offer an incentive of $55,000 to the program, which then you see from the energy savings and the dollar savings, that brings the program down to about two-year payback. Uh, as a little bit of an aside, I'd mention that uh, um, people are often shocked at the amount of energy that these grow facilities use. Um, this is a... Um, uh, uh, the room we're looking at here is a typical grow room for these facilities, it's about a thousand square feet, uh, 25 by 40 square foot uh, room. And that 25 by 40 square uh, uh, sized room uh, uses about the same amount of energy as 20 houses use in that one area. Um, and then these grow facilities might have 20 or 30 of these rooms in the building. Uh, so when you start adding it up, it's a staggering amount of energy that these facilities use. And that's one of the reasons we find it's it's very important to try to reduce some of that energy wherever we can. And a lot of that energy is on the lighting side, about the same amount of energy is on the dehumidification side as well, uh, which I, I'm not getting into here on this slide if I keep things simple. Um, can I stop there for a second? Say, Autumn, about how much time did you expect me to talk here right now before I get too long-winded? Um, we have slotted about 35 minutes for all of the presentations. Oof, okay. All right. <laughs> I'm going to jump quick. You, okay. You can take, you can take a little longer. Um, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> 35 for both me and Frank, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. If you each need so, about uh, 20, that's okay though. Okay. So, uh, with that out of the way, uh, uh I'm going to talk about a uh, real high level. I've got uh, three or four slides on our small business program a couple of slides on our large business program, and then I'm gonna talk about our incentive applications, all right? Um, so when we talk about our small business programs in New Hampshire, through New Hampshire Saves, you'll see these are the thresholds that we use to define what, what programmatically we consider as a small business customer for, for us. <clears throat> and you see, if, if you're a gas customer, it's about 40,000 therms uh, of gas annually. And if you're an electric customer, it's 200 kW of monthly demand, uh, which for an energy geek like me means something for, for, for the average person, the kW demand doesn't mean a whole lot. So I'm translating that into, it's roughly 100,000 to $200,000 
in annual electric usage, electric bills. So if you're below the, these two thresholds, you, you would fall into our small business program. As you can see, the vast majority of our customers fall into the, the small business category. And New Hampshire Saves really has a three-pronged approach in what they offer on the business side. We, have, we offer for these small commercial customers uh, energy assessments. We offer turnkey installation. And then we offer incentives. And on the next slide, I'm going to talk about those three items in particular here. So uh, energy assessments for, for, for all of our small uh, business customers, uh, you're eligible for, for a free energy audit. Um, that free energy audit will, will come in. And the goal is to come in and identify hopefully the five or six areas where, where uh, five or six most prominent areas where you might save energy in, in the facility. Um, oftentimes that's lighting. So these audits generally will include lighting in the mix of that. Uh, but it'll also include uh, often, uh, it'll often include uh, uh, heating systems and hot water systems <clears throat> and insulation. And then they'll also touch on uh, specific areas to specific buildings. So if it's a restaurant, obviously we'll get into the cooking equipment, for example. Uh, but the idea is to present uh, uh, five or six areas and try to give budgetary information uh, on, on proposed cost and proposed energy savings for these particular measures. Um, and uh, fo you know, following that energy assessment, uh, we, we offer uh, what we call a turnkey installation service, <clears throat> which is largely to say that, that that audit company can come in, the same company that did the audit can come in and, and actually do the, the installation of those measures as well. Uh, and uh, as you see here, that typically, it, if they're doing those measures, uh, the, the New Hampshire Safe program for these small business customers typically covers about 50 to 70% of those project costs. Um, now, out, outside of that turnkey installation work, uh, we also offer incentives through, <clears throat> through an application process. Um, and I've categorized them. We break them down a couple of different ways, but I tend to look at them as prescriptive, custom, and midstream incentives. Um, and I'm going to get into a little more detail on those after I've talked about the large business uh, um, uh, program. Um, uh, the incentives, when we get into the applications, are going to be the same for a small business and a large business customer. Um, the incentive applications and the process is completely the same, small and, and large business. So I'll talk about those at the end. Uh, but first, I want to jump in and I'll, I'll give you some uh, high level overview of our large business program. Um, so on the uh, on the large business side, uh, obviously, we're, we're going to now be above the thresholds that we were on the small business side of things. Uh, and you'll see that and then naturally we're about 3% of our customers are large business. Um, you know, th those 3% of actually customers, that's an <clears throat> in number of customers. Uh, but, but interestingly, those, those 3% of customers are somewhere around 30 to 40% of the load. Uh, on, on our on our lines, interestingly, uh, but in quantity and number of customers, it's actually about three percent of our customers. Um, and on the large business program, very similar to what we offer on the small business, and that we have these energy assessments. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about technical studies, which is a little different on the large side, and then again, the incentives are going to be the same for both the small and large business customers. Um, I should stop there and see if there are, I apologize for not stopping early. Any, any questions along the way at this point? I'm glad to answer anything as we go here. And I, I probably only have another five or seven minutes to go here. Would there be a more efficient way of growing plants of one kind or another other than uh, uh, like maybe an attached greenhouse might be a smarter way of approaching that? Yeah, the uh, uh, there are, so greenhouses use a lot less energy um, you know, in the, there's a challenge you, you grow per, per, for, for the square footage that you have, you grow less product, whether that's a cannabis or a flowering product or, or vegetables or flowers. Um, but, but it's, it's far, far less energy to grow in a greenhouse. And, um, when you look at cannabis, uh, as it goes throughout the country, 
a lot of states are starting to look at trying to require growing in um, in greenhouses rather than indoor growing. Uh, and part of the reason being that, and interestingly, <clears throat> in Massachusetts, the cannabis growing industry is somewhere around three to five percent of all the electric use in the state. But believe it or not, I mean it's a staggering amount of energy, and it's probably you know ten to twenty times more energy intensive when you grow indoors as opposed to growing outdoors. Uh, but it's you know it's it's statewide policy that that determines are people allowed to grow in certain ways. Brad, it's Joe Bird. Yep. Right. So these are incentives you're giving to businesses, small mm -hmm. and large. What's the benefit yep. to Eversource or or uh, Unitil? What's the benefit to the supplier? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so so the benefit is largely at 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 a very high level and fundamentally. Uh, the the idea is here that um, you know as populations grow, as businesses expand, <clears throat> we're using more and more energy. If 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 you don't use more energy efficient equipment, right? So energy usage keeps going up and up as population increases, and <clears throat> at at some point that increase uh, requires uh, infrastructure changes and tremendous investments to be able to add on that additional customer. Uh, you know, at some point you reach a threshold and now for ease of simplicity, you have to build a new power plant now to, to meet that, that next customer. At some point you cross over that line. So the benefit is that, uh, that by reducing energy use and that spending and that investment on the energy incentive side, you minimum, you, you, you avoid that, uh, that, that additional cost of infrastructure, if that makes sense. Uh, you know, I should also note that um, that a, a key point here is that these um, you know, these incentives are funded really through the ratepayers. And so there is a small fraction of your bill that comes in from that comes in to support these programs, and then that money that's the money we're spending as as rebates. And and again, getting back to the reasoning for that, uh, it, it's more cost effective to use that money to reduce energy usage than it is to upgrade upgrade the wires and upgrade the pipes or to build new power plants. And I imagine, Brad, too, just going beyond sort of total energy use, which I think you described well, or electricity use in this case, um, that the peak demand reduction is super important also. And that probably plays in greatly with how the utilities are able to, you know, secure their supply contracts and, and everything else. Yeah. Yep. Yep. A absolutely. I mean, that's, um, you, you know, especially when you look at, uh, well, both on the wire side of it and on, on the, um, you know, the new power plant side of it. Absolutely. And we, I, I'm not going to get into this level of detail on the incentive side, but we, we do have a program offering, um, and maybe Frank's going to touch on this on the residential side, but it's it's getting pretty detailed where we have a demand reduction offer so that on the commercial side, we actually work with a handful of our larger commercial customers <clears throat> who will, if we request it of them, they will curtail on the most energy intensive days of the year, which are typically the, the warmest days of the year. So we have this program. It's not included in this presentation, but <clears throat> it's a it's a voluntary program. Uh, on the commercial side that customers, we would send out a, a, an email blast to people saying, if if you curtail, then you would get uh, you know, such and such reimbursement for, for, for curtailing at this point. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have another one, unless someone else wants to go, if, if there's time. Yeah, if, I'm good. <laughs> um, at least, okay. And some communities, at least in terms of water utilities, a bit of a metaphor, similar, but not the same, uh, uh, they charge more the larger the amount of usage you have. So you reach a certain threshold of, I don't know how many gallons in a month, suddenly your rate is increased significantly to contain the amount of usage. Uh, is, that, is there a similar structure to utilities uh, for power? Or the more you buy, the cheaper it gets. 
Um, it, it's, I mean, it's going to vary utility to utility. Um, um, on the, so I, I can speak to, to Unitil side on the, um, on the commercial side, you know, we, we, we do have difference based on the, on the, on the customer size. And it's not what I'm talking about here is large versus small in our rebate side, but we do have some differences in, in how it's built based on, we categorize customers into a couple different, you know, five or six different categories on the gas side, for instance, and that does affect the rate, but it's not, I, I, I think you get into an area, we're, we're talking an area now that I, I can touch on and, and, uh, and just barely, but it really gets into uh, uh, how, how rates are set, which really isn't my end of the world here at Unitil. Um, but, but to answer your question, it, it varies utility to utility. And there oftentimes are, if you use more, sometimes it could be more and sometimes it can be less, um, but it, it's really all over the place. And it, it starts to get into really the regulatory side of things, which oftentimes that, that what you just asked is, is not really dictated by the utilities. It's more the regulatory bodies in the state and what they want and how they want to do. And there's a negotiation that goes on back and forth there. I, I don't know, if, Frank, you want to weigh in on that perhaps, but. Um... Yeah, I, I can say that on the residential side, there's, there's no difference in, in a threshold like that. Um, everyone pays the same rate no matter how much they're using, it's per kilowatt. Um, on the commercial side, it's not my area of expertise, but I know one of the big factors there is the demand um, charge. So as we talked about before with um, peak demand, a commercial car, I think a large commercial customer in particular will have a set charge based on their peak um, usage for that, for that day. Um, and they get charged at a rate based on that. So if they come in in the morning and turn all the machines on um, and their usage spikes for five or 10 minutes, they get charged at that spike um, for a portion of their bill for the rest of the week or month. I'm not sure how the rates are broken out, uh, but then the, the per kilowatt usage is, is the same um, regardless of what threshold um, you hit. So the, the demand charge is really what makes the difference. If they're using more electricity, they get charged a little more. I'm sorry, I have another question to either Frank or uh, or Brad. Is how or do planning departments in cities and, and towns encourage this kind of thing, whether they're developing a you know a new business or a residential? Are they encouraged to to look at these things as well? Uh, from even from the town wide from the town level or are the towns what is their motivation to try to promote this type of thing yeah if, if a builder comes in and says i'm going to build you know 400 departments our planning department's saying that's terrific uh what are you doing from an energy perspective um i it, it's an area i don't i don't know much about mm -hmm. uh, i i i based on my experience in the industry i i, I would say it's something that is often not it, it's quite possible it's not addressed you know it's it's often not an area people think of um you know i'll, I'll mention on the I'll, I'll give an example going back to grow facilities uh, and this is maybe tangentially related at best but maybe maybe very tangentially related you know they put these laws into place in massachusetts that allowed allowed growing of cannabis and they required it to be indoor growing and the folks that were making those rules and setting that up, I, I can tell you at the time, gave no thought whatsoever to energy. And it wasn't until much further down the line when facilities started coming online that it started to be recognized that this is now, you know, three to 5% of the state's energy use. So I, I think it, energy tends to be one of those things that just, uh, it, it, it tends to get overlooked oftentimes in, in the early planning stage. So. Well, I, I don't know the answer to your question, but it wouldn't surprise me at all if it's something that really isn't addressed too much. And I don't know if the other panel members want, you know, want to comment on that. Yeah, you know, I can add where you, you asked specifically about building large apartment complexes. On the those typically fall into the residential side, um, and it's it varies by town. 
most towns in the state are not thinking about energy at all. That's part of the reason we have programs like this in the new construction field trying to promote higher efficiency energy star homes. Um, there are a couple of towns in particular that have really started to look closer at energy like Durham. Um, they've adopted a, a higher level code, standard code than the rest of the state. Um, so they're already thinking about that bigger picture long term going for stretch codes and versus the old, I'm not even sure on the residential side, which code we're at now for most of the state, but it's it's at least four or five years old. Um, so they, they're they they're not really thinking enough about energy at this point. I, I was gonna add to just, just from my perspective that there are things that municipalities can do in terms of their, their zoning um, in specific areas to, for especially large you know, construction projects or things in the, you know, sort of the, the core um, to, you know, promote energy efficiency, to promote renewables, for example. However, you're kind of at the mercy of what the state law allows for. Um, and we're really hoping, at least here in Dover, that there will be an update to the, the building code that requires a higher standard for energy efficiency that we can kind of hang our hat on. Um, Durham's been pretty progressive, like Frank mentioned, and sort of pushing the boundary with that. But you kind of you kind of have to be careful of working within what's allotted, you know, by state regulation. I'll uh, I'll move on then for the moment. Uh, so on, on the large side, uh, I was going to talk about these offerings here at the bottom of the energy assessments, technical studies and incentives. I'm sorry, energy assessments, and technical studies. <clears throat> on the large side, and I'm going to dig into the incentives for both small and large. Um, so uh, so the energy assessments that we do are, are, are for our large customers that I work with are very similar to the energy audit on the small side. Our small customers, we offer a free energy audit. Um, for our large customers, we'll, we'll typically, typically there's a cost share, and it's, uh, that cost share is often around 50%. Um, and these, these energy audits, you know, comparing them to what we work on with a small business customer, these energy audits are, are, are generally uh, more complex, um, and, and go into greater detail, uh, require more technical expertise in very specific areas where we might be working, uh, with compressed air systems. We might be working with molding machines and, you know, any wealth of, of very, uh, uh, detailed, uh, complex equipment. <clears throat> so uh, oftentimes industrial engineers that we engage with to come in and do these assessments or, you know, they might spend, depending on the size of the facility, they could spend a day or two walking through the facility to develop these assessments. <clears throat> and again, with these energy assessments, they, they are, they are geared to provide a, a, a budgetary level of input uh, uh, of data. So you know, ideally they come into one of our large commercial customers and they develop eight to 10 potential measures for that customer. And the idea is to generally be plus or minus 20% with the numbers and give some idea that, hey, if you pursue this particular measure, here's the payback. Uh, uh, you know, if you replace your compressed air system, here's the payback. Um, um, and uh, what we often do after that initial assessment then uh, and, and sometimes I will say these energy assessments can come in and give specific detail that is sufficient for someone to make a decision on the project. Uh, but, but oftentimes, again, these are budgetary numbers to say, do we want to try to pursue this a little further and fine tune the number? And then what we'll offer to these large commercial customers is a technical study which typically comes in and looks at one particular measure. It can, it can look at multiple measures, but oftentimes a technical study will look at one particular measure. And I'm working with a customer right now up around Concord, New Hampshire, uh, where they're trying to uh, assess the impact of putting in a new compressor into their facility. So the technical study we're doing there is actually going into the, into the facility. We're installing flow meters, uh, to monitor their compressed air usage and take, and which will be able to analyze their compressed air load profile and how that plays out over the course of a day to then decide if they put in a new compressor, <clears throat> how much energy are they actually going to save? And the result of that technical study is going to be uh, 
uh, is going to be, yes, annually based on your metering, we, we, we think you're going to save about 30,000 kilowatt hours a year. And we don't know that exact number, but we're, we're no longer plus or minus 20, 30% now. We, we know it's going to be pretty darn close to that, that level. Um, so we work with a number of our large customers to pro provide these types of technical studies. Uh, again, t typically the, the, these are done with a 50% cost share. So the, 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 uh, the incentive, if you will, that we bring into that is the 50% of the technical study. Um, uh, for those technical studies and for these energy assessments, I should say, um, we have vendors that we work with that can do those studies that I've experienced with that I, I, I know have done a good job and, and we can use those vendors, but it's not a requirement to use those vendors. Uh, and often, and, and generally, the, and those vendors generally are not, uh, are not reporting to me, you know, they, they, I am not hiring the vendor, typically the vendor in these cases being hired by the customer. So they can use vendors that we recommend, or they can uh, they can use any any vendor they'd like. Um, so um, with that, I'm going to jump into the incentives that we offer, um, and then I think I've just got a few more slides, and then I'll break here. Um, so <clears throat> we've got prescriptive and custom incentives, and we've got a midstream offering. Um, our prescriptive incentives uh, are largely designed to give customers and installers and vendors. Uh, specific information that if they put in this unit, here's what they're going to get for it. If they put in a two by four recessed LED light, they're going to get $60 for that. And uh, uh, oftentimes that, or I shouldn't say oftentimes, those incentives are really designed so that you, you don't have to reach out to the utility to see what you're going to get. You can make budgetary decisions based on knowing that you these incentives are available at this point. Um, so these prescriptive incentives, we have a separate application based on the product category. So we have a, a prescriptive lighting application, prescriptive boiler application. Uh, we have one for variable frequency drives. And I'll give some examples of that at the end. So again, it's basically, if you install this, if you install this boiler, for instance, you're going to get $2,000. Uh, um, now, beyond that, again, we, we've got I think five or six different prescriptive applications covering really uh, the majority of what customers will typically install in their facility. Uh, but outside of that, we have a separate application for custom measures as well. And I'll often tell custo uh, customers that we can really provide an incentive for anything at all that, that saves energy in your facility. And we can do that under a custom incentive application. Um, um, and um, yeah, I, I, I've I've done applications for 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 molding machines. Um, customers have put in a new molding machine, and there's tremendous uh, energy savings by using a more energy efficient molding machine. Uh, we have customers that will will redo the compressed air system in their facility and put in um, um, all new piping in in that facility. Um, and can be a tremendous savings in energy there. I uh, could go on and on with these custom measures, but we, we break custom measures into two different types, um, new construction and retrofit types. It's two different applications, new construction and retrofit. And new construction, um, as I was talking about earlier with this grow facility case study, with a new construction application, we look at what's that additional cost to the customer to get the energy efficient equipment. and our custom applications typically will cover 50 to 75% of that additional cost. <clears throat> On the retrofit side, we're looking at the entire cost of the customer, and typically the range is in the 30 to 50% for those uh, retrofit applications. Um, the last one I'll talk about is uh, midstream. Uh, we have a, a point of purchase uh, uh, program where we work with a number of distributors uh, in the technologies you see below here, we work with lighting distributors, we work with HVAC distributors, food service distributors, and for a number of products, when when a, a, a when a, a installer goes out to the distributor to purchase the equipment, uh, they actually have the incentive amount taken off taken off at at that point of purchase, and we call that a midstream offering. Um, and um, I, I, I'm I'm not going to go into that much further, but I'm glad to answer any questions about that. 
I did just, I've got, I think a few more slides just to hit high level, some of our prescriptive incentive offerings, and then I'm, then I'm going to be done and out of your way. So a uh, prescriptive, prescriptive lighting incentive, <clears throat> this didn't come across great um, on the screen, but it, you know, we have 40 or 50 different categories of lighting, again, to give people an idea, to give customers and commercial customers an idea of what, what they are eligible for if they install certain types of equipment so they don't have to come to me with every, every little thing. Uh, uh, and we have 30 or 40 different categories. What you see on the screen is just three or four of them, but these are some of the more common ones. So you'll see here that it, for an LED, interior fixture, which can be any of these size fixtures, a two by two, two by four, one by four fixture. There's a $60 incentive for those fixtures right there. And again, there's 30 or 40 different categories. I'm just showing one of them here. <clears throat> um, for space heating equipment, um, so uh, boilers and furnaces, uh, you'll see on the left-hand side here, uh, if you install a condensing boiler, that's in the range of 1,000 to 17,000 MBH, um, uh, you, you get a $7,500 incentive. And you can see the breakdown, the, the different ratings uh, by, by size of boiler, MBH being a typical size of these boilers. Uh, on compressed air systems, um, if you're putting in a new air compressor, <clears throat> we have incentives for systems up to 75 horsepower. So for a system for a 75 horsepower compressor, when you put in a new one, that's an energy efficient uh, type of compressor, which is largely a variable speed compressor. Uh, we have $100 per horsepower. So a 75 horsepower compressor uh, qualifies for $7,500. Um, so I just wanted to try to hit high level. Those are really our more common prescriptive incentives. Um, that does tend to cover 70 to 80 percent of what we do on the commercial side is those prescriptive incentives, and I'll just close by saying, on the if anything else, uh, we, we can we can process it as a custom incentive, and and I'm always glad to work with my customers on that. And I think uh, I think that's all I had. I've got my contact info here, and I presume Autumn will send that out or already has sent that information out. Um, and I guess I will uh, I'll close out. Um, any questions while I'm stopping the sharing here? Well, first, before we go to questions, I just want to uh, thank you, Brad, for that really informative presentation. I feel like I learned a lot on the CNI and, and small commercial, large commercial side of things that I, that I wasn't aware of before. Um, I noticed real quick, and I'll hop to a question in the chat too, but you know, you showed the example of the prescriptive incentives for the boilers. Um, maybe this is because you're focused sort of on the, the gas util side. Um, do you know of any incentives for electric heating systems like air source heat pumps or zone heating or, or mini splits or, or anything like that? Yeah, we, there, there are incentives uh, for heat pumps. Uh, and I, I, I know Frank can touch on this too on the residential side. Um, uh, on, on the commercial side, uh, it winds up being about, uh, I believe the incentive is uh, $250 a ton for system size. Um, and I know Frank, I, I mean, I know we have a similar incentive on the residential side as well, uh, but there is, and that's, that's done as a prescriptive incentive. Yeah, the residential so, heat pump um, incentive is the same. They, they do have to be high efficiency, cold climate, uh, yep. They need a certain threshold, but it's two hundred and fifty dollars per ton, and it's on based on the cooling rating of the unit. Okay. We're using them for heating in a lot of cases, but um, a typical ductless mini split in a residential application that might service uh, a couple of rooms would be a, a one or two ton. So you could get about five hundred bucks back for that one. Okay, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, I did see a question in the chat from. Barbara, she's asking um, sort of what the situation is with, or like what the overall amount is estimated to be provided through New Hampshire Saves. I saw a report a while back um, that was submitted, I believe, to the state sort of describing 
the overall program benefits or the anticipated benefits for 2022 and 2023. Um, so customer cost savings, it, it estimated 441 million in cumulative savings of, over the lifetime measures for participating and non-participating customers. Energy savings, somewhere around 2 billion kilowatt hours of electricity and 5.4 million MMBTU of natural gas. Um, and and so on. So those are outlined um, in the the statewide energy efficiency plan. And folks, the experts are on the line, so please correct me if I'm misquoting any of those. But I believe that those are the latest values that were um, put forward. Yeah, I can. Those are those sound about right. I don't have them in front of me, but looking at her question, I think she might be asking about the the budget amounts. Okay. Um, so that and I can give you some rough statewide numbers. Um, it Lately, it's been running at about 100 million a year um, statewide for all four utilities on the electric side. Um, and that that money is mostly come in uh, through like what Brad said was through small charges on every customer's bill um, called assistance benefits charge. There's some other um, places that we get funding for this. So like from ISO New England, um, for the reduction in, in the electric load on the grid, we get some some incentives back from ISO, and those get rolled into these programs. Um, and then there's a, a regional greenhouse gas initiative grant um, that the Public Utility Commission had, had given us. Um, and it's relatively small; it only goes to certain programs. But we pull in as much funding from anywhere that we can get it. But it's primarily just those systems benefits charge. All right, very good. And Steve, I know you you mentioned something about the the Bitcoin mining. I hadn't heard anything about that. I don't know if anyone else on this call has any information. That seems seems counterintuitive to me, but um, yeah. To summarize a little more clearly, um, last year, 2022, uh, there was a commission, uh, Sununu set up a commission suggesting that perhaps uh, it's, it provides benefits to the grid to have Bitcoin mining in the state. Yeah, I can't really, I'm not no expert on that either, but it does sound to be counterintuitive because it would be in increasing the load of electricity. I mean, it. I guess it could be beneficial to the state because it'd be bringing in more revenue sure. and electric usage. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions uh, specifically for Brad or Dave? If not, then let's move on to Frank's portion of the round okay. um, And I know Brad went a little long. So um, if I need to go faster, just let me know, but I will try to skim through some of these as much as I can. You have about 30 minutes, and I'd say since we've it's just been pretty discussion based at you know going in and out of the presentations that you know feel free to use as much of that time as you need. So. Okay. And looks like I'm gonna struggle with getting this present presentation up just like Brad did. So give me a second here. Are you seeing my full presentation or are you just still seeing the PowerPoint? Uh, just the, the PowerPoint. Okay, how about now? You, uh, if you switch your display okay. or you go to display settings and swap your view, then we'll be able to see full screen, I believe. We're seeing presenter mode currently. Sometimes you can do that actually right in PowerPoint. Um, you can just have them both be presenter mode or not presenter mode, full screen. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's try it again. Okay. Now, if you go, yeah, display settings to the right. 
where you are now um, at the top top option bar. I don't see your uh, the drop down at the top of the the PowerPoint in the presenter view. There should be that display settings with the computer and the little the gear um, up at the top, all the way up next yeah. to show taskbar. Nope, oh, there a little it is. higher. Yep, and then swap. Yep, there you go. Yeah, it got hidden by my um, my screen sharing menu, but gotcha. Okay. So awesome. Um, so I'm going to go over the residential uh, programs um, at a fairly high level. I'm going to go pretty quickly because I know we're running short on time. But um, if anyone has questions, feel free to chime in at any point. Um, and Brad already kind of explained a little bit about how this is uh, not an Eversource only or a Unitil only program. It's a statewide offered by the four electric and gas utilities. Um, first, in, especially in the residential side, um, one of the things that we really push and promote um, is energy conservation over energy efficiency. So there is a difference between energy efficiency and energy conservation. So as an example, with a light bulb, um, an energy efficiency measure is taking an incandescent bulb and replacing it with a more efficient LED bulb. Energy conservation is actually shutting the light off when you leave the room. Um, and in our world, the, the cheapest way of saving energy is always conservation over efficiency. Uh, because when you conserve, you're actually stopping the use of it, not just limiting what you're using. So we have a, a wide suite of residential programs uh, available, um, everything from lighting and appliance. We have a refrigerator recycling program, heating and cooling systems on the electric side, uh, the new construction program I mentioned earlier with Energy Star Homes. And then we have a couple of full weatherization programs um, that are mostly focused on saving heating energy, not necessarily electric energy. But I'll go over each of those quickly. Uh, so in the appliance program, we're always trying to promote the uh, Energy Star label whenever possible. So Energy Star is, is kind of the standard out there for residential um, products, um, appliances. So whenever you're you're buying a new appliance, the way I like to explain it to folks is that you're you're paying for that appliance once you put a down payment on it when you buy it, and then you're paying for it every time you use it. So if you save a little money on the initial purchase and you buy the cheaper appliance that may not be as energy efficient, you're saving money right then. But over the life of that appliance, you're probably going to spend more money for it because it's going to cost you more to operate it. Um, Energy Star has other benefits as well. So they're testing and um, protocols that are there um, so that you know that that product is, is of a good quality and is going to last. So one example that um, we saw a lot of in the lighting um, industry when compact fluorescent lights first came on the market, they were a lot of them that really flooded the market fast and they were very expensive. So the ones that were Energy Star had gone through that testing you knew how many cycles you'd get out of that bulb before it would actually burn out, um, despite what's on the label for marketing it. So a lot of these, you know, mass producing out of the country suppliers would produce bulbs much cheaper, skimp on the testing, and then sell them at a cheaper price point because they could sell more of them. People were buying them and then they'd get a bulb that on the cover says, you know, it's good for 20 years. And in about six months, it would burn out. And they spent you know, $15 for that bulb. So it was a little crazy at the beginning when the market just took off um, and Energy Star and the standards hadn't really caught up to it yet. Um, the refrigerator and freezer recycling program that I mentioned at the beginning of this. So this is a program where if you've gone out and like renovated your kitchen or something and bought a new refrigerator um, because you wanted stainless steel and you had a white one, um, most people aren't just gonna dispose of that refrigerator. It ends up in a garage or in a basement still plugged in, might have a six pack of beer in it, um, or once or twice a year on big holidays, it'll end up with a bunch of leftovers. That refrigerator is costing you a significant amount of money to run. Um, refrigerators and freezers operate much less efficiently when they're not full. So when you've got that second refrigerator in the garage with just a little bit of stuff in it to keep it cold, it's taking a lot more energy, not only because it's an older, less efficient appliance, but also because it's mostly empty. So we've 
we talk to people all the time that have chest freezers like that, that they may be a hunter or they, they go out once in a while and stock up when something's on sale and they've got to keep it plugged in and running and freezing things all the time. But if it's going to be empty for a period, you're much better off to throw in a couple of bags of water or ice uh, and take up the space. And then that freezer will use less energy to keep that whole thing cold. But the best approach is always going to be to get rid of that appliance. So most of your transfer stations or recycling facilities are going to charge you when you bring in an appliance that has any kind of coolant in it. So a refrigerator, freezer, and air conditioner. This program will send someone to your house, pick up the refrigerator or freezer for you, remove it, properly dispose of it, recycle all the material in it, and then send you a check uh, for, it was, and I haven't updated this presentation, but it was $30. This year, it's $50 for an incentive. So if you go to the dump and try to get rid of your second or old fridge, they're likely to charge you $20 or $30 for it because they've got to pay someone to drain the refrigerant out of it. Um, this program will take care of it for you and give you a little bit of money. Uh, then we've got heat pumps. So we talked a little bit earlier, um, the, the incentives that are for heat pumps, they are on cold climate rated, um, high efficiency heat pumps. So the idea is in New England, you don't wanna be installing a heat pump that was really designed for cooling in Arizona. Um, it'll cool fine here, but when you get into the heating season, it gets down to about 30 degrees and then it won't keep up with the heat load. So the cold climate rated ones that we have incentives for are producing heat efficiently down to like minus 30 now. So there's no reason for any sort of need for a backup um, or a, a reheat element that goes into a heat pump. Uh, some of the early earlier whole house heat pumps got a real bad reputation because they weren't rated cold enough and they would have electric heating elements in the ductwork to make up the difference. So when it was too cold out to produce the 70 degrees you set your thermostat at, the electric heat um, resistance heat would kick on in the ductwork and keep you nice and warm. And then you'd get your electric bill at the end of the month and you'd have just as high of a bill as if you had electric resistance heat. So the new construction program, um, again, I said it, it was an Energy Star program. Um, so we participate in the EPA's federal standards. Um, it, it's always better to start right from the beginning. So you can do as much improvements on an existing home as you can, and you'll never get it as energy efficient as you could if you did it from the ground up. So there's a lot of places when building an Energy Star home that you can't get to after the house is already built. So even things as simple as when they stand up an exterior wall, in an Energy Star home, you're laying down a sealant below from the floor of the house to that wall plate that sits there. That prevents little tiny leaks that are everywhere in a house. So that house, an Energy Star house, you can actually build it to the point where it's so tight, um, you have to have a mechanical ventilation system or you end up with you know, indoor air quality issues. And most of those Energy Star homes are required to have that level of efficiency. So the idea is always to seal up as tight as you can possibly seal it to prevent natural air exchanges and then mechanically do those air exchanges so you can get just enough that you need and not too much. Uh, the incentives for that program, um, they're, they're not huge. So when you look at the price point from building a standard code built home to building a high efficiency Energy Star home, you're gonna invest a lot more money up front in doing those extras that get you to that standard. Um, there's a small incentive um, that gets you some of the way, but the biggest piece of this is it provides um, HERS ratings, a professional auditor who comes in and, and works with the builder from the beginning, even looking at the plans and giving them some pointers if what they have spec'd out for the house is not going to be enough to have enough insulation in a particular surface. They'll tell them what to change so that it will make to that more efficiency standard and get the incentives. And then it provides those HERS ratings, which most towns now are requiring a HERS rating in order to get a building permit. And that program provides it for free as part of the, the participation. And then we have our, our whole house energy efficiency programs um, that are taking an existing home and trying to improve it. Um, there's lots of reasons to do energy efficiency and we find that customers are attracted to different reasons for this. So not everybody is thinking about 
how much their heating bill is going to go down. Some of them are thinking about how comfortable the house is or that they want to reduce their overall footprint, um, carbon footprint, or their overall energy consumption. So the Home Performance with Energy Star is our primary um, existing home program. It looks currently at high fuel use homes. So there is a threshold you have to, you have to meet in terms of the amount of heating fuel you're using per square foot of the house. If you make that threshold, um, then you get in and you get a full comprehensive audit from a Building Performance Institute auditor, a BPI standard. Um, they come in and they do a full top to bottom audit looking at your insulation levels. They do a bunch of testing for like the air leakage in the home. Um, they'll look at things like lighting and appliances uh, and give you a report of what your home needs in order to be more efficient. Part of that process too is they will also give you the incentive amounts that you could qualify through the program. So what it covers is roughly 75% of the cost of installing all those measures, um, up to a maximum of $6,000 per home. And then we have um, low and 0% financing available if you wanna go more than 6,000 or if you need the financing to cover your cost share of that. Now it says 75%, but it's there are some items within that that we actually covered 100%. So like air sealing, as I said, in the new construction, that's one of the most important places to, to make your house more efficient. So any of the air sealing that's, that's done is paid for at 100%. There's no customer share. But things like insulation are paid at 75%. Um, all those measures have to be installed through our program network. So it has to be one of our certified contractors. They all work with fixed pricing statewide. So there's no shopping around, um, trying to find a different quote from a different insulation contractor who's gonna give you the best one. We do all that work ahead of time. Um, and we assure that those contractors are gonna install it properly and using the right equipment, uh, the right material. So to qualify, um, we have a, a statewide website set up where customers can go and, and self-qualify to see if they make that, that heating use threshold. Uh, and that's energyaudit.nhsaves.com. There is a link directly from the nhsaves.com site um, where all these programs have more information. If you go there to try to qualify, you're gonna need the name of your electric utility, the condition square footage of your home. So that's not the entire square footage, it's the area that you intentionally heat. So if you have a unfinished basement that has no heat in it, you wouldn't include that square footage. It would only be the, the main living area zip code, and then the amount of heating fuel purchased in the last 12 months. So it's we work with any fuel. Um, the gas utilities, Unitil and Liberty Gas, also participate exactly the same in this program. Um, so they will be you know, looking at how much gas you used. Um, if you use electric for heating, you have to contact your electric utility first. Uh, because they'll have to do an analysis on your electric bill to determine how much of it is actually heating use versus other appliances and lighting, things like that. Um, but if you take the last 12 months of oil, that's what you heat with, um, you put that in and then you put the square footage in, hit a button and it'll do a calculation and tell you where you land on the, the threshold screen. If you make the threshold, it gives you a, a link to an electronic application where you can fill it all out online submit that with copies, digital copies of your bills. You can take snapshots of it with your phone and upload them as PDFs or JPEGs. Um, so it's very simple to apply. If you don't make the threshold, there is another option for a customer. It's called currently called a visual audit. We're probably gonna change the name. It's a little mis misleading. Um, it's not actually a full audit. It's a, basically a, a direct install program where we'll send a vendor out and they'll do some direct installs of light bulbs. Um, you can get a Wi-Fi thermostat, um, some other small install measures, and those are all at no cost. And this is the visual audit. I'm getting ahead of myself, I guess. Uh, so it's a no cost walkthrough. There's no customer costs at all, but you don't get the full comprehensive audit. You don't get a report telling you how much insulation you need. All that stuff doesn't, doesn't apply to this version of it. Um, and one thing about the qualification process that we've, we've heard a lot of 
complaints from customers are, you know, it's quite possible that if you've been very conservative with your heat, keeping your thermostat low, um, shutting up, closing up bedrooms that are not in use, and you've kept your fuel usage pretty low, um, your house may need a lot of work, a lot of insulation, a lot of air sealing, but you're not using enough fuel to meet the threshold. There's no way to make an exception the way this program's designed. Um, and that is based on the way we claim energy savings. We can't claim the savings like your oil savings for adding insulation if you're not using that much fuel to begin with. So in order to keep all of the projects cost effective, which is another requirement that the utilities are have to do, um, you have to be using a certain amount of fuel in order for the money that we're going to put into it to prove out as cost effective. And then lastly, we have um, an income eligible version of that program where it's the same idea that they do a full comprehensive audit. Um, they look at everything the house needs. The huge, the big difference here is that these are for income eligible customers. So there's no copay. So we pay for 100% of the cost of installing all those same type of measures. We do a few other measures here in this income eligible program that we don't do in home performance. Um, and it's a difference of it goes up to 15,000 per home instead of 6,000. There's, we're not allowed to charge a low income customer anything for these types of audits. So we partner with the community action agencies in the state. Um, they have access to federal and state funds, their weatherization program funds. And in most of these jobs, the caps are funding some things with their federal money and some things with their utility um, HEA money so that the customer gets the most out of the program as possible. Um, we also do full heating system replacements in this program, as long as we can prove them out as cost effective. And here I am getting ahead of my slides again, but so that's um, the 100%. The big difference here, like I said, is there are some cases in this income eligible program where we'll actually replace windows. Um, windows are not an eligible measure in the home performance program. Um, they're often one of the last things anyone should be thinking about in terms of weatherizing and, and saving energy on your heating bills, um, despite what window manufacturers have done a great marketing campaign of convincing folks that windows are the, the, the best solution and will solve all your problems. A lot of good reasons to replace windows, but saving energy is usually not one of the top ones. And that was my quick and dirty residential presentation. Did anyone have any questions for me? I went kind of fast. I have a quick little comment. I went through the application process quick. Yeah, some of what you said was that uh, about thresholds. Uh, in our case, it's about a thousand square feet that we're heating with about four cords of wood, and uh, that's considered a, a high energy use, which we're quite efficient. Uh, so I was, I was pleasantly surprised that I qualified. Uh, it looks like with my preliminary numbers. Yeah, and wood is one of those fuels that it's it, it can be a little bit tricky um, to qualify because unlike oil or propane or even electric and gas, you don't always have the ability to get bills for wood delivery. Um, you know, I know I heated with wood for years and I cut all my own wood. Um, so I never had any receipts except for, you know, some gas receipts for the chainsaw and the wood splitter. So we've made some exceptions with that, um, that we allow folks if they've heat with wood to provide a picture of your wood pile um, and oftentimes a, a written statement saying how many quart of wood you burn. And then what we usually do is the auditor that's coming to do the, the main audit, they'll be, they've been trained to look for signs. So if they show up at a house that says it burns four or five cords of wood a year and there's a little parlor stove and, you know, hardly any wood stacked around, they know to stop and, and come back to us to get more, more validation of the heating fuel. Frank, it's Joe Boudreau. Um, a lot of these I was not aware of. What's the marketing guy? How do I get this? How do, how do I become aware? You know, that's... That's been a, an ongoing problem with these programs is they're, they're known as kind of the best kept secret in the state. So over the years, um, we've had much lower budgets and there was very little marketing ever done because, you know, word of mouth has always been our best way to, to spread the word. So you'll get someone who finds out about the program either through a contractor or stumbles into it. 
Um, they go through the program, a good experience, and they tell their friends, and then they go through it. And what we found over the years is that when you try to do real marketing campaigns for this, the utilities just get slammed with trolls and, you know, haters, uh, you know, honestly. Uh, and we do a lot of, we try to be as cost effective with the funding as possible because it's, it's not our money, it's customer money. So we will do marketing campaigns now that the budgets are larger. And oftentimes we'll do a lot of social media because it's, it's cheap. You know, you can, you can put out ads and we have Eversource has ads and NH Saves has ads all over Facebook now. And you look at some of the comments in there, no matter how you phrase that ad about trying to tell people about the great things that these residential programs will do, you just get slammed with Northern Pass haters, you know, outage haters, rate haters, especially lately. And it, it really starts to wear on, on the public. So they don't even want to look at those ads anymore. They don't want to try it. They don't want to click through to do anything. So we still really rely a lot on customer word of mouth. Um, you know, we used to send bill inserts. Um, anyone who got a paper bill would get a little flyer slipped into their bill with it. And most of our customers are electronic billing now. The ones that are still on paper never respond to those. They, you know, I know when I get stuff like that in the mail, it goes right in the recycle bin and I don't look at it. Um, so that's that's the thing is in getting the word about these programs out. Um, it's over the years we found that it's really a better message coming from the public. So from presentations like this and organizations like like yours, or we do a lot of work with local energy committees that go out and spread the word about the efficiency programs, that gets a better response than any kind of traditional marketing we've ever done. Just to put a plug in here, being a, maybe more of a senior citizen, I would think that reaching out to people like AARP, you know, I mean, I, I did a lot of, not a lot, I did some work uh, with AARP where we were doing, uh, helping people with their uh, income taxes. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of folks out there that I think could take real benefit from this, uh, and again, working through an organization like AARP may be a nice direct way to get to some real people that could use it. Yeah, that's a good point. We'll, we'll think think hard on that because you know it is with the the amount of scams that are out there now. Um, it's really hard to get to to customers and make them believe that something like, especially this home performance program or the income eligible program, even it sounds too good to be true. And then the fact that it's coming from your electric utility, you know, why would my electric utility want to save me money on my bill? That doesn't make any sense. They're trying to, you know, rob me of all my money. Um, and it's really, that that's not the case. And people don't understand it, but you're right. We'll, we'll try um, with ARP. Yeah, I think, you know, municipalities can play a role in this as well. I mean, here in Dover, we're, we're trying our best to spread the word about New Hampshire saves. We don't want to overwhelm you guys, obviously, but we want people to know that they can take advantage of these programs. Um, for example, I, I tied in a section on energy efficiency and conservation to the citywide resilience plan I'm working on as sort of a public facing document, trying to get the city council behind, you know, promoting the use of these programs throughout the community. Um, so, the, you know, planning offices, but you know, just having people within your local government be aware of this. So when they speak to people about the rising cost of energy, that you can at least point them to a resource to, to help. Yeah, and we have worked directly with, with several municipalities. Um, I know myself personally, I've been working with uh, the city of Keene with the mayor um, about their 21 and 21 program where they were trying to promote energy efficiency and we would partner with them on that so we're always looking looking for partnerships like that with the municipality um, on the residential side and i'm sure on the commercial side too um, i know on several of our eversources commercial programs have done um uh, what do they call them um street street bursts or something like that where they they go to a municipality and they just hit every business small business on this the the street during a you know one week or a couple of day period and just try to focus in on them to get the attention there. Any other questions for me? Not seeing anything in the chat at the moment. Does anyone else have any, any questions? I know we're coming close to the end of the session here. I'll throw in a, a brief plug, uh, Jackson, just as to the, 
to these programs that uh, Frank and Brad just described. So I've, I've worked with uh, communities and customers and developers um, over the years. And, and I think, um, I think Joe, I think you had mentioned earlier about what's the benefit to the utility. Um, and the real benefit here is, uh, is to maintain and maximize the capacity that we have in those wires, in those pipes in the ground. As you can imagine, right, there's, there's limited capacity in all these pipes. Um, and the whole, like we, we touched briefly on rates and, uh, you know, energy rates are really set up in two different components. There's a distribution rate, which is maintaining those pipes and wires. And then there's the commodities piece, which is the actual energy itself. So these programs help to keep that distribution side in check by, by utilizing the capacity. If you've got a 10 inch pipeline that runs right down through the middle of town, I can assure you those towns don't like it when you have to dig that street up to make that a 12 inch pipeline. Um, and same things with increasing the size of wires. Um, so the more we can keep those, uh, those costs in check, the best cost on the distribution side is the avoided cost. Um, and if we can maximize that capacity by utilizing every bit of it before that has to be upgraded um, and that by in these programs, that's exactly what they're designed to do. Um, and, and I think we kind of, you know, there's, there's kind of a whole cycle here from um, getting knowledge out there about these programs. Uh, I'm in the, all the chambers and, uh, and on it, different committees and um, and that's, you know, it starts at the, at the planning board and there's, you know, I think as, as you mentioned, kind of Frank, there's different, different planning boards encourage different ways and some might have zoning rules and some don't. Um, but then it goes into design phase and does the, you know, say on a big commercial building, right? There's an engineering firm and do they spec out the high efficiency equipment? Are they familiar with these rebates? Um, and, you know, it goes through that whole cycle into the build and then, and then there's the usage and can we, uh, can we maximize that capacity that, that are there in those pipes and wires to keep, to keep energy costs overall um, in check? Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Joe. So just, just to all the panelists, what about solar? Where does that fit? I think solar, Joe, doesn't, I mean, get, correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is more about energy efficiency and energy conservation, where that's an, another energy producer, an alternative energy producer. Um, so I, I don't know, are there incentives for things like solar panels through New Hampshire saves? There are not through New Hampshire saves. Uh, the state has some, I believe, and the federal government is going to have some more with um, coming up. But the solar gets tricky for the utilities because you know there's the the utility the distribution network in New England in general was designed originally, you know, in like 1900 or something ridiculous. It's it's ancient. Um, it's been upgraded over the years, but it was really designed to take power from a couple of, of central locations, power plants, and then distribute it out to the different areas in New England. Um, when you get into the, the burst of solar recently and the popularity of it, it's adding some complexities to that network that it was never designed for. So now you've got a bunch of distributed generation. So you've got hundreds or thousands of houses in New England with solar panels on it that are back feeding into the network that was really only designed to take it from a central location and, and distribute it out. So it's it's working, but it's not working well and it's not working efficient because it was never designed that way. Um, and that's part of the reason the, the state has had caps on um, on net metering, where if you're if you're you've got solar in your house and you're producing more solar than you're using, you can sell it back into the grid. They had to limit that at some point because there was it was such a huge growth of solar in the residential market in particular, but also in some commercial applications, that it was starting to be, frankly, dangerous for the net for the network for the distribution network. I have one last question. I apologize for taking up time here, but what about smart metering? What about like we have relatives where if you do your um, laundry at nine o'clock at night it's going to cost you less than doing it at nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I can, I can say for, for Eversource, we don't have those time of use rates at this point. Um, that type of smart metering is, is out there. Most of our meters in the state aren't capable of it. So it would be a, a fairly large investment. 
upfront in order to, to get the infrastructure in place to do that type of, of metering. Um, I believe the New Hampshire Electric Co-op might have some smart, more smart meters on their network and they have some of that. Um, we're, we've thought about it certainly for demand reduction type of applications where you, know, you can try to get the people using off-grid, off-peak um, to do that. But we just don't have the, the technology in place the, the smartest our ever source meters have gotten at this point is that the meter reader doesn't have to go to the each individual meter now and write it down. You know, it's utilities are, are notoriously kind of behind the curve into a newer technology. And it's because of a reliability standpoint. You don't always want to take that first kind of new fancy technology when it comes out in case it fails. Because when it's when it's delivering your electricity, you don't want you know, the meter to crash and all of a sudden you're without power. So it, it, it's possible that we'll get there at some point in the near future, but it's certainly not on the horizon um, at this point. I know there's more discussion about that, like I said, from the, the demand side, especially with um, electric vehicle chargers now kind of getting more popular and they're a significant draw um, that, you know, the current demand programs that we have in place now are primarily on the commercial side. Um, that Brad spoke about early on in his presentation. On the residential side, I know we've tried a, a small pilot with Wi-Fi thermostats for heat pumps and electric heat. Um, it was limited, so it was a relatively small group of customers. I've heard from lots of folks that say, I'm, I'm trying to sign up for that and it won't let me. And it's because they needed a control group to see how well it actually worked before they go there. But there'll be a lot of interim steps like that before we get to the level of smart metering where you could you know, specifically offer a different rate at a certain time of day. Uh, and I will add, you know, I think when we were discussing topics for this call, there was a request to talk about rates a little bit, which I don't think any of us at the on the utilities are really qualified to talk too deeply about it. Um, I can tell you that, um, as was explained earlier, that there's two portions of your electric bill, the distribution and the, and the generation portion of it. Um, the generation portion of it, for anyone who's on a utility's default rate, it's what that utility could negotiate um, for a contract for the price of electricity, and it's a straight pass through. There's absolutely no markup on the utility side. We don't make any money on that. It's a service. Um, we're not allowed to make any money on it. So the way the Public Utility Commission set this up is each utility, regulated utility, has to go out to bid to buy electricities for their default rate every six months. So depending on where the market's at, we're at the, the mercy of the market right now. And unfortunately, you know, the recent rate increases that we've all experienced have been because of that market. The market went nuts between the price of gas and the war in Ukraine, Ukraine and all these other factors got in there. And then the, the people who own the generation just started raising their prices um, for various reasons. But then when you go out to the market as a utility to say, okay, I need a contract for the next six months, they're like, all right, here's the rate. It's up here. That's what you get. You can't negotiate. You can't go somewhere else. If you don't like it, everyone's charging that rate. So we're stuck with it. Whereas you get some of the independent power producers like um i can't even think of the names of them now but the the folks that are offering to you to buy their power from them instead of from the utilities they're not regulated so they're allowed to go out and buy yep. you know power for you know three-year contracts and some of them had long-term contracts like that that were set up a year year and a half ago when the rates were really low the market rates so they're still able to pass that those savings on to customers. The risk there is that because they're not regulated, depending on your contract terms, they can do almost anything they want. So that's, we had a, a big spike of problems at the beginning of that, where people were getting teaser rates saying, you know, you get, everyone gets that junk mail of saying, you know, if you, you pay for electricity through Eversource, we can save you tons on your electric bill. And you look at the fine print in the contract, they're saving you a 10th of a cent for the first three months, and then they're gonna charge you, you know, three times as much. And they don't have to notify you. They don't, they can throw in uh, fees for, you know, for canceling early out of your contract. There's a whole bunch of the fine print that you gotta really watch. 
But from a utility perspective, their default rate is the rate that they were able to get power from out on the grid and we just pass it through. And briefly before we close, because we're at time, I will add, you know, the community power initiatives in New Hampshire are starting to take off and they introduce other options for folks as well um, in terms of their electricity supply. Again, sort of a mix of not being as regulated, but also operating under, you know, defined rules through state statutes. So we'll close, I think, with, with that since we're at time, Autumn. I don't know if you have any last remarks, but I want to thank all the, the panelists uh, for being involved today. You guys gave us some excellent insight into New Hampshire Saves on sort of both sides, commercial, industrial, small business, large business, and also residential. So thanks again. Um, and Autumn, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you to our panelists. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day and uh, thanks to our participants for coming. Um, I will be sending out a follow-up email with the contacts for Brad, Dave, and Frank um, and any other necessary materials or links. So you'll be hearing from me within the next week or so. Um, and then we will also be putting the recording of this meeting for folks who couldn't attend um, on our YouTube uh, so I'll send that link out to you. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you have a great rest of your day and stay safe in the snow. Thank you, Autumn.